This is a presentation celebrating the 350th anniversary of the city of Elizabeth. I've called this little talk, Elizabeth in the Wider World from 1664 through the American Revolution. I am Ken Ward, a trustee of the Elizabeth Historical Society. I am speaking today about some of my favorite topics, history, economics, and espionage. I have been involved with these houses, the oldest in Elizabeth, for more than 30 years, and every year I have learned more about their history and their place in world history. I was a history major in college, so I had a general picture of the time period when both of these houses were built. From college, I was recruited to be a special agent in the Office of Special Investigations, where I hunted for spies and military information, mostly related to personnel at the Boeing plant and the weapon systems they produced. Nothing but the tools of espionage has changed since ancient times. Generals still want to know where their enemy is, how many men the enemy has, and what kind of weapons they have, and most important, where is he going to meet his enemy in the future? New Jersey was the location of about one-third of all of the battles in the Revolutionary War, and Elizabeth was right in the front line of this global war. Elizabeth was then, and is now, a part of the global economy. That is one reason why the Elizabeth participants were so valuable to General Washington and so important to the success of our American Revolution. In this global war, Great Britain was fighting the other European powers in India, in Africa, and in the Caribbean. Why India? Why Africa? Why the Caribbean? Few people would guess why India was so important to the American Revolution. Did you ever watch those battle scenes and those battle movies and all the smoke and all that are accompanying a battle? Did you ever think that most of the gunpowder then in the world came from India? Several European wars in the 1700s slowed to a stop because the armies ran out of gunpowder. French gunpowder was weak and often misfired, and Chile was not yet developed as a source of the raw material. The Spanish governor of New Orleans gave Washington five tons of gunpowder, but most gunpowder came through the island of St. Eustatia, a Dutch sugar island in the Caribbean. That island was a critical spy and supply center for the entire revolutionary period. Today, we fight over oil energy. In the 1600s, the world relied on another form of energy, sugar. Sugar not only makes things taste good, it preserves food, and most critical, it is the source of rum and molasses. Sugar is human fuel. The rum ration on ships was half a pint a day of 57% alcohol by volume. Beer was okay for short times at sea, but rum was needed for long time travel. Those big British warships had a crew of 800 to 1,000 men. These ships could provision themselves for up to a year. The ships were provisioned with salted meat, vegetables and lemons, and bread for nutrition, but for energy, half a pint of rum every day. Likewise, people in Elizabeth drank all sorts of sugar-based drinks and used sugar for preservatives and sweeteners. A house like this always had a punch bowl with some alcoholic drink in it. Being rich, Royal Governor Jonathan Belcher, who lived in this house, he drank a bottle of Portuguese Madeira every day. To harvest sugar in the early 1600s, the British on the Caribbean islands used British convicts. That worked just fine until they ran out of convicts. Convicts didn't live very long on sugar plantations enter the slave trade from Africa. The total number of slaves brought to the British Sugar Islands was 1,401,300 slaves. The Dutch imported 500,000 slaves 
and the French 1,600,200 slaves for their Santo Domingo Sugar Island. Perhaps the grandest palace of all was Versailles in France, was built with sugar money. The French gave up all of Canada to keep Santo Domingo. The prime source of wealth for the British, French, and Dutch empires was sugar related. Land to grow sugar cane was so valuable that the British sugar islands imported much of their food from the mid-Atlantic colonies, New Jersey in particular. Our Union County area was prosperous and the main export destination for our farm goods was the Jamaica and Barbados sugar plantations. No doubt some of the food exports went to the French and Dutch sugar islands. They called that trading with the enemy. We were mostly paid in molasses from which we made rum and other sugar products. During the revolution, our gunpowder for the revolution came from the Dutch sugar island. Most tax revenues came from sugar and sugar related products like alcohol. The British strategy to win the American Revolution was to separate the 13 colonies in two groups. The separation line began in Montreal in Canada and ended a bit south of Elizabeth, New Jersey. With the colonies separated, the British thought that they could concentrate on the southern part and then go to the northern part. Economically, the southern part was more important because it supplied the sugar islands of the Caribbean. The Elizabeth, New Jersey vicinity is the southernmost rebel location on this separation line. Elizabeth faced the large British army on Staten Island and was a most critical point of observation, that is, a spy location. The first piece of information Washington wanted from spies and the observers was the whereabouts of the British ships cruising from the Atlantic Ocean up the Hudson River. The Royal Navy had hundreds of warships around North America and the Caribbean Sugar Islands. At the high point, the British Navy had 750 warships, including the mammoth firepower of the first raiders like the 100-gun HMS Victory. These ships could turn a land fort into powder with massive cannon fire. Two or three of these ships carried more cannon and much heavier cannon than Napoleon had at his great land victories. George Washington usually remained just out of range of such firepower. It was the job of the spies and the observers to let Washington know where the big ships were and which ones were carrying troops that could be landed in New Jersey. The British Parliament at the time of the American Revolution needed soldiers in India, remember the gunpowder, and other places such as Gibraltar and the African Cape. The British could only support 50,000 soldiers for all of the Americas. The British needed to protect their investment in the Sugar Islands with soldiers and ships. The ships were needed to keep other nations away, and the soldiers were needed to keep the slaves from revolting. There were 64 slave rebellions on the 22 Sugar Islands, so 25,000 soldiers were assigned to the Caribbean and 25,000 to fight Washington. The question now comes to our attention. Could Washington have won the American Revolution if he faced 50,000 soldiers and not 25,000? Did the slave revolts on the Caribbean Sugar Islands actually save our revolution? I think so. We know that Washington changed his attitude towards black slavery based on his war experience. At the most desperate times in our revolution, it has been estimated that up to 25% of his soldiers were black. Unlike other founding fathers, Washington freed his slaves and made provision for children and elderly slaves, as well as attempts to keep families together. Now I want to connect the role of this house and the residents to the American Revolution. The documentation for these events was compiled by Dr. Paul Mattingly, recently professor of history at NYU 
and now president of our Elizabeth Historical Society. For many years, local history buffs have repeated a legend about George Washington's visit to this house, the Belcher Ogden Mansion, to attend the wedding of Catherine Peartree Smith to Elisha Boudinot. The building's original owners remodeled and enlarged this building in about 1750 to house the royal governor, Jonathan Belcher. The New Jersey royal governor arrived in 1751 and remained in this residence until he died in his bedroom in 1757. Why did Elizabeth want Governor Belcher to live here? Who was royal governor Belcher? He came from Boston son of a prosperous family. Jonathan Belcher was a pretty smart young man. When he was young, he went and made a trip to England and made an additional trip to Hanover, now part of Germany, to meet Sophia, the electress of Hanover, and her children. Because there were no immediate heirs to the British throne, an agreement had been made with that Sophia's children would one day become the kings of England. Belcher stayed with Sophia and her family for some time and knew her son George, who would one day be King of England. This personal re relationship certainly helped Belcher to be appointed the Royal Governor of Massachusetts and New Hampshire, and later New Jersey, and Governor Belcher's son Andrew was appointed to be governor, Royal Governor of Nova Scotia, Canada. Governor Belcher was well connected and his presence in Elizabeth was a commercial and political benefit. After the death of Governor Belcher, his house and some of his furnishings were purchased by a close friend, William Peartree Smith. Smith was a graduate of Yale University, a founding trustee of Princeton University, and the mayor of Elizabeth. The Smith fortune came from the island of Jamaica where the family owned sugar plantations. Local Elizabeth legend says that Port Royal Smith, the father of William Peartree Smith, was a royal governor of Jamaica, but I have found no documentation to support this story. It appears that Port Royal Smith was probably a privateer, which is a legal pilot, and the plantations were purchased by him using the plunder from his pirate-type activities. By the way, not all pirates look like Johnny Depp. Some Elizabeth Town families invested in piracy. One privateer ship, the Sturdy Beggar, was built right here in Elizabeth and sailed with an Elizabeth crew. Even Elizabeth Mayor Samuel Woodruff was part owner of the Charming Betsy and was known to trade with the enemy. Sugar plantations were the present day equivalent of owning large oil fields that provide a substantial, steady income. In a nutshell, the Smith family was very rich. How rich? One afternoon, King George was in his coach riding around London with a friend. The king and his friend were passed by, by an elegant coach, much finer than the king's coach. King George just commented that the fine coach was probably owned by a sugar planter. The Smith family traveled to London and were believed to have had their portraits painted by the same artist, Sir Godfrey Heller, used by the royal family. Remember that William Smith had been a friend of the royal governor Belcher, and that Belcher was well known to the royal family for several generations. The Smith family also knew the right people on the world scene. On October 14, 1778, Smith's daughter, Catherine Peartree Smith, married Elisha Houghton who was the brother of Elias Boudinot. Elias lived down the street in the incorrectly painted barn red house. I was told by Mrs. Kane that rich men would not have used cheap red barn paint for a fine Elizabeth residence. The red paint would have been used as an undercoat of paint to save on the expensive white color paint. Elias Boudinot had been president of the Continental Congress and would, 10 years after the Revolution, host George Washington on the night before his inauguration in New York City. Martha Washington stayed with the Kane Livingston family up in Union. In our collection 
here at this house, we have the shoe buckles worn by Elisha at that wedding. We also have a dessert porcelain set of gilded china that Catherine Perry Smith acquired on that London visit. The legend tells us that there was a Belcher Ogden wedding reception for the newlyweds, attended by Alexander Hamilton, acting as master of ceremonies, with dignitaries who included George Washington, the Marquis de Lafayette, and William Alexander, who was also known as Lord Sterling. Lord Sterling served as a general in the New Jersey Brigade. Lord Sterling was also the brother-in-law of New Jersey Governor William Livingston. It appears that Washington did not object to the use of the Lord title by William Alexander, so he is generally referred to as Lord Sterling. A, late, a later owner and resident of this house, Warren Dix, president of the Union County Historical Society, published an article in 1923, Old Houses of Elizabethtown. There, Mr. Dix summarized the key features of the legend, and because of this careful description of the many historic features of this, his own home, and other city residences, the story about the Boutonot wedding took on the authority of fact. Many later individuals, including Mrs. Mary Alice Kane, who worked here in this house many years, repeated the legend and as she led groups through this residence. For the 300th anniversary of Elizabeth in 1964, E.J. Grassman, an historically minded Elizabeth entrepreneur, financed a professional history of the city. The result was Theodore Thayer's As We Were, the story of old Elizabethtown. Tucked in a footnote was Thayer's observation that Washington could not have attended the, the October 14, 1778 wedding because he was in Fredericksburg, New York, about 65 miles away. Lord Sterling supported this distance by writing from Elizabethtown to General Washington on October 14th. Here is a grand wedding of Miss Smith to Elisha Boudinot. The ladies press their compliments to your excellency and his family. Thayer also specifically stated that the wedding took place at this house, the Belcher Ogden Mansion. As an aside, he noted that the wedding dress bought by William Perry Smith for his daughter was seized and sold according to law because it was smuggled contraband. The poor bride, Thayer continued, quoted Lord Sterling, was put under mortification, that is, she was very embarrassed, at being married in her old clothes. The story becomes more complicated when still later investigation revealed that all of those named in the legend were seldom together after the Battle of Monmouth in July of 1778. Hamilton remained close to Washington as his aide de camp, and trusted with writing the general's letters. But Lafayette went on to Boston, and by year's end he had returned to France for a year and a half, not to return until April 1780, and not back in Elizabethtown until October 1780. Our collection includes a pair of French crystal vases engraved with Catherine Smith Boudinot's initials as a somewhat late wedding gift from Lafayette to the couple. We have those exhibited upstairs in the Belcher bedroom. Lord Sterling had returned to his base in Elizabethtown, and he closely monitored British ship maneuvers in the North River, as well as keeping a watch for foraging raids from Staten Island Tories. Washington himself kept on the move, and in October 1778, was in White Plains, Fishkill, and Fredericksburg, all in New York. Never long in any temporary headquarters, he was not back in Elizabethtown until December 1778, readying himself for relocation to his winter quarters in Middlebrook, New Jersey. With all this activity and movement, how could the legend have arisen? And more important, what might it tell us about the interpersonal relationships of the Revolutionary War? 
Washington's intensive letter writing, weekly and sometimes daily communication with officers and political leaders from Boston to the Carolinas dramatizes the necessity and problem of communication, not to mention accurate knowledge. Throughout the general's correspondence, there is the difficulty of his knowing with any certainty where the British Army was and how Washington's scanty forces should respond to an attack. Washington gives constant advice to fight defensively, skirmish and pull back, to learn the enemy's strengths before committing soldiers and material to any battle. In October 1778, Washington knew the British fleet was moving on the North River, but he could not figure out their military strategy. Were the British going to strike, or were they merely looking to stage foraging missions along the river? Washington was very preoccupied with a full-scale British attack on West Point and various other strategic locations all the way down south to Elizabethtown. Washington's strategy was to, was to rely on local systems of reconnaissance with spies and military observers. Washington, Washington emphasized all this information gathering in many letters to General Anthony Wayne in the West Point Highlands and to Lord Sterling in Elizabeth. A fine point about the spy business is that if you were in uniform and tell what you saw, it is reconnaissance and surveillance. And if you were caught doing it, you were just captured and considered a prisoner of war. If you are not in uniform and you tell what you saw, you are a spy and you will be executed if you are captured. If the British saw a man in uniform, they knew they had been spotted. If in civilian clothes, they could not be sure. Washington's own officers relied on surveillance and everyone knew the importance of watching the waterways, where initial preparations for attacks would begin. However, Washington's close friend, the Marquis de Lafayette, had his own devious methods. Lafayette was very, very rich, and that helps if you're in the spy business. If he was not actually in Elizabeth during the last half of 1778, he was in intense communication with two individuals. The first was Elias Boudinot, the fellow who lived in the white, now red house, up the street, whose work for the American cause took the form of the undramatic office of Commissary of Prisoners. It was, a, it was his task to travel under flags of truce to Manhattan, confer with the British General Clinton and his officer chain, and to see that the American prisoners were properly, properly fed and clothed, which they were not. Boudinot was also charged with a delicate task of exchanging British for American prisoners, especially the officer class. The British military was always very careful about officers as prisoners, so anyone authorized to negotiate prisoner exchanges was carefully respected. Prince William, the son of King George III, was a soldier stationed in New York during our American Revolution. And at one time, Washington authorized a plan to capture the prince, who was the future King William IV of England. It failed, but it illustrates that Washington was well aware of the trading value of hostages. And Washington himself knew that he was the most valuable target for capture, a major reason why he moved around so much. King George III probably felt his son William would be looked after because General Lord William Howe, the British commander, was considered the king's uncle, as his grandmother was the mistress of King George I. That was the young prince that Governor Jonathan Belcher met so many years before in Germany. Small world. Elias Boudinot had the ability to communicate directly with the British but his association and communication with Lafayette made his work still more important. Lafayette explicitly offers a hundred guineas, which is presently equal to about $250,000. And for that $250,000,
He wanted hard information from Boudinot's spy ring about British shipping intentions. Is the fleet about ready to depart for the southern colonies, for the West Indies, or for a return to England? Boudinot's access to the British routines of Manhattan made him and the city of Elizabeth a central link in the most important spy work in this portion of war. Boudinot, when traveling under a flag of truce, was not a spy, even though he could be observing military conditions, which he was. The British could have blindfolded him if they wished to do so. In addition, Lafayette wrote to Reverend James Caldwell, the pastor of Elizabeth's First Presbyterian Church, to activate his spy ring. Lafayette makes an offer similar to that he made to Boudinot and puts sizable amounts of his own French money to learn of British plans. Reverend James Caldwell was both a Presbyterian clergyman and a quartermaster of the New Jersey Brigade, and he traveled everywhere in search of supplies for the soldiers. His movement took him to areas of both support and resistance to the revolutionary cause. Of course, such a, way, such a situation put him in touch with individuals who were seeking profit from whatever source. Lafayette was suspicious of many of his own spies, saying in one letter that a very clever fellow probably mixed British gold with French gold at the bottom of his pocket. During the war, the Reverend Caldwell's wife, Hannah Ogden, would be killed, colonists said murdered by a British soldier, an event memorialized on the Union County flag to this day. But her death was likely intentional, given the known work the minister did for the colonial cause of both supply and information via his spy ring. Indeed, the minister himself would be shot in the back and killed near Elizabeth Fort, supposedly for not obeying a, a British sentry's order to halt. Caldwell may have been overconfident in his ability to pass between those supporting and those opposing the British, as he had done so many times. Spy work is a life-threatening occupation. The information gathering network not only made Elizabeth a central point to New York and points north, strategically important to the war, it was also a place for planting false information to confuse the British. Boudinot was often asked to drop false information items in his exchanges with the British to mask Washington's actual intentions and his whereabouts. As important, Washington himself not only kept a highly mobile pattern so he would not be caught, it was not out of that character for him to identify a temporary headquarters as some place other than where he actually was. Washington was a noted horseman, often traveled great distances in a short time. In early December, he signs letters from Elizabethtown, then suddenly he is writing from Paramus, normally a day's entire ride up to Bergen County. Two days later, he's back in Elizabethtown. We cannot actually know where George Washington was. We only know where he wanted the British to think he was. In Washington's December 1778 visit, Elizabeth also contained many of the guests of the legendary wedding reception, Hamilton, Lord Sterling, and Washington. And Washington would have been welcome for even a brief experience had time allowed. Washington was given a festive entertainment in Elizabeth on December 4th, 1778, but it does not mention where. It could have been at the Red Lion Inn, which is the site of the present Elizabeth Public Library. The wedding reception might have received little notice amidst Washington's needs to figure out British intentions. In his published letters, Washington made no mention of the event. However, his correspondence repeatedly insisted of his desire to talk with individuals like Boudinot and Lafayette, who were genuine friends as well as comrades in arms. It is also quite likely that the legendary wedding reception was a separate event from the actual wedding ceremony. The actual wedding ceremony occurred in Westfield at the Presbyterian Church, rather than Elizabeth's first Presbyterian Church, where William Pertree Smith 
and served as a trustee. So it is not a local Elizabeth event over a day's carriage ride away. Moreover, Catherine Smith Boudinot was married in her old clothes, rather than a festive ceremonial gown fit for a wedding reception. That gown was formally confiscated by Lord Sterling himself, as he admits, because Washington had expressly ordered a ban on all smuggled contraband. An effort to slow wartime profiteering among the colonists, and also plausible cover for the British to use with their spies. The incident did not preclude Lord Sterling's invitation to the wedding, which he pronounced the grand wedding. But the likelihood is very strong that the two events were separate if the reception was held at William Peartree's Elizabeth residence, this house. Elias Boudno had asked his brother Elisha, the bridegroom, to serve as commissary of prisoners for New Jersey, ensuring that, though Elisha's authority was smaller, that he had his own spy ring and his own strategic role in wartime information gathering. He was a person whose work and relatives would have made his wedding reception an obligatory affair for Washington and his officers. The Boudinot wedding thus involves several very important figures of the Revolutionary War. It is surprising that it is not announced or later noted. The absence of comment, however, did not mean the wedding reception never happened. Still, the British spy network was not idle, and supposedly a fortnight later, two weeks, the British soldiers arrived at this Belcher Ogden mansion intent on capturing possibly George Washington himself at a reception, according to the legend. They undoubtedly knew Elizabeth was constantly a busy switching place with soldiers and officers moving from the city en route to Washington's Middlebrook headquarters. In a letter from George Washington to Elias Boudinot on February 27, Washington invites Boudinot and his family to visit him in Middlebrook. The British failure to find the general meant that in his absence they took their revenge on the house. They dragged the furniture and the paintings, including the super expensive ones bought in London, into the street and burned them. An event that was sufficiently traumatic to William Peartree Smith's wife that she persuaded her husband to move to Newark with the family. Elisha Boudinot himself had set up a law practice in Newark. The wedding reception legend of October 1778 is not entirely mythology. The story captured the strategic importance of Elizabeth as an exchange point for supplies and information during the American Revolution. It illustrates the role of the important figures of the Revolution who were associated with this house. The legend itself shows the kind of mixed fact and fiction that explains why those in spy networks were so critical. More importantly, the legend makes clear that history is not a chain of incontestable facts, but rather a story that uses documented evidence to convey historical understanding that is more than the sum of its parts. So, where in the world is Elizabeth, New Jersey? First in my mind, as a totally unique observation, are the buildings on East Jersey Street. Where else in the world is a street with buildings dating from the 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, 1900s, and the 21st century, and still in use, that have been in continuous use for 350 years? Of course, many places have older buildings, but I can think of no place with a street so actively represented by so many centuries. The traditional Elizabeth area, after 350 years, is still a significant port, and that includes a mammoth container port and an airport complex. The oil tanker shipping, coupled with the refining and the pipelines to the airport, make this a unique location as a modern transport hub. The immediate area, is still a major smuggling location, and that includes undocumented workers who, regardless of legal standing, contribute to the economy 
no less than the smuggling carried on by our nation's founding fathers and our Elizabeth town leaders. No doubt we are still a spy location. Our adversaries and competitors are constantly changing because commercial, economic, and political interests change. Since 1664, France has probably changed most often. Spain next, and now China is in a transition from foe to something else. The ethnic demographic changes in Elizabeth and the users of these houses reflect all of those shifts. Elizabeth has not missed any of the population changes. Whatever future international business opportunities develop, somebody in the Elizabeth area will be around to intelligently evaluate a possible profitable connection. I believe that a hundred years from now, someone could read this entire speech changing only a few numbers and still be accurate.